Um, I'm not an editorial cartoonist. I've never even played one on TV, but I uh, really, I'm a family doctor and I see patients. I've seen patients the uh, day before yesterday and I get a lot of my one-liners from them. It's a real treat to be here. Um, I should warn you that my talks tend to be hazardous to people's preconceptions about smoking. Um, I often tell the story that, uh, of Harry Truman as a way of mentioning that I'm not uh, anti-smoking. I don't think it's going to be an anti-smoking talk. He was a very salty president had a very foul mouth, and a lady was at a, uh, a garden show with him and asked him if he could come over and look at her flowers. He said, lady, I don't know a damn thing about flowers, uh, but uh, you sure have some damn swell flowers. Uh, would you use some damn swell manure? And the woman by this time was beat red with embarrassment, terribly mortified, went over to Beth, Harry's wife, and said, you should be ashamed. You should have him say more polite words like fertilizer. And she laughed at him stare at a straight face that you should be grateful that in 25 years to get in the same manure. <laughs> so I hope in maybe just the next 25 minutes or so, you won't regard anything I say as anti-smoking, because we got to be neutral in this field, uh, but rather anti-heart disease, anti-cancer, anti-high medical costs, because I think we're dealing with the single most preventable cause of death and disease. But how is it that I approach my patients? I used to have a forehand finger wag and a backhand finger wag, and. Uh, I, I saw that humor was a lot better uh, to approach uh, patients with, and that's what I hope to bring today. Um, I just want to thank a few people, not only David, uh, but Scott Stantis and uh, uh, Michael Ramirez and Lucy Caswell, Jim Lang, uh, Clyde Peterson, uh, and a whole host of people, also Wayne Stasekill, who really got me started in collecting work. And this is the very first talk I've ever given out of about uh, 1,500 presentations. The joke is that the lady introduced me in Texas to Beaumont Rotary Club said, Dr. Blum has been invited to lecture in more than 50 states. And in, in <laughs> fact, that's uh, about right. Um, and, um, and, and I have uh, had this opportunity to, to collect and to do all this, and I've, I've wound up tracking down about 1,250 editorial cartoons, not skip cartoons at all, uh, on the subject of tobacco. For this presentation, I, I tried whittling it down as best I could. I, I got down to about 300, which I made into slides, and then over the last uh, three weeks, I've been whittling it down to what you'll see today. Um, I used to edit the uh, New York State Journal of Medicine, as David mentioned. Um, this was the very first theme issue of any medical journal devoted to the world tobacco pandemic. We went all around the world. It was uh, so well received by the physicians that we went into a second edition, uh, following which I was fired for spending too much time on tobacco. They wanted me to write articles about how physicians can't afford their third Mercedes and you know the high cost of malpractice insurance. And uh, I did two issues on smoking out of 36 that I edited, which gives you an idea that that was considered too much. Well, immediately they discovered, because of the attention that this got, and the Washington Monthly and, and uh, the Columbia Journalism Review and so forth, that, hey, maybe they could get on this too. And so that's when the AMA and all the medical side has started to figure that smoking might be a good PR thing for them. And I say that with all due respect to physicians, my colleagues, but organized medicine and its leadership has been in collusion with the tobacco industry almost to the present. And I, I hope to unravel some of that for you. Well, we made them into a book uh, called The Cigarette Underworld. Um, it, it, you know, it, it didn't sell. I've got all the remainders. If you'd like a copy, uh, I'm happy to get you one for some extra background. Uh, and, and the good news is actually uh, that you're here, and you might not have seen this morning's headline, uh, Justices Rule in Favor of Tobacco Firms. So I can't collect any more cartoons, so I'm just glad you're not working today on this thing. And uh, that way, that's, that's more for the mill that I don't have to worry about. But in any event, let's get started. Uh, physicians are reading medical journals, but uh, what is the average individual reading? Uh, they're not reading medical journals at all. They're reading, for instance, uh, uh, oh, let's go back. The, the uh, headlines like this, uh, Trick Cigar Blows Man's Head Off. I think that's about right. That's the typical one. Uh, we can uh, turn the lights just a tad so I could just watch who's nodding off and can make fun of them. But is there a dimmer on? Oh, okay, all are on? Okay, we'll take, we'll take off. But uh, this next slide is called What America Means to Me. Uh, beer, cigs, video food. I shot this on the way out to the... Uh, uh, Houston Hobby Airport one time, I literally pulled over, stop, I've got to take that picture, because I thought, this is it, this is America's priorities in order, uh, what the average 12-year-old sees growing up, you know, don't get me started on alcohol either, it's not that kind of issue, but you know, there's this cartoon 
that said, uh, Pop, is there some kind of law that says you've got to be an athlete to be in a beer commercial? But I mean, that's really the way it is with, with these things. The products that don't do the best good for you seem to be the most promoted. Somebody said, well, what happened to sex? Well, obviously that's in the videos, but you know, the, the whole point is food is dead last, and that could be reversed. But um, I've been tracking this industry sort of like a, a, a virus for the, for the past uh, 25 years. I actually got started with my father in the late 1950s when I was uh, a very small child. And uh, we'd be watching the Brooklyn Dodgers. Uh, we were avid Dodger fans. And if anybody trivia buff remembers who sponsored the Dodgers, uh, which cigarette brand sponsored the Dodgers? Lucky Strike. How about the Yankees? Camel. And the Giants, because we had three teams in New York, they were sponsored by Chesterfield. Now, literally, if you went into Brooklyn and you asked for a pack of camels, you didn't get good service if that meant you were a Yankee fan. So closely tied were branded imagery uh, to this uh, sport that my father was upset, and he said, as we were watching his Lucky Strike ads, you know, you ought to tape record these. I couldn't have been over eight years old. Because one day, no one will possibly remember that they could associate sports and cigarettes. Well, in about two weeks, here in uh, Toronto, you're going to see the Molson uh, race, sponsored in part by Player Cigarettes, Marlboro Cigarettes, and a brand from Brazil called Hollywood. Uh, it's absolutely astounding, and that's going all over the world on satellite TV. I went last uh, uh, year to uh, Alabama's uh, uh, most important cultural event, the uh, Winston 500, and there were 174,999 fans and me. Uh, out there watching Winston, Winston, Winston rolling around on national television with so many millions of viewers. So nothing has changed. Well, I go to their meetings. I've actually, I'm the only person who has the distinction of being thrown out of both a tobacco industry meeting and an anti-smoking meeting. Um, I, I, I think it's because I think both sides terribly lack a sense of humor. And I figured I'd show up. Why not? And uh, here we are in Raleigh, North Carolina, a few years ago. And by the way, no, actually, I don't always use my name. I, I have another name that I go by. I started a company called Phil Tui and Son, better known as uh, Pete Tui. And uh, I knew this audience would get that. In case you didn't, my brother did a, a piece. You know, that's Pete Tui. That's what the cartoon characters say when they spit. And so I'm walking around with this name tag on saying uh, Pete Tui. And all these tobacco uh, company people are saying, excuse me, what is uh, Pete Tui? And I'm trying hard not to laugh, and so I say, oh, I'm, I'm just a, 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 a strategist, a, a, someone who's studying the industry. Oh, they say, oh, let, let me get out our confidential financial report. And so this is the kind of tables that you see. If you look at the top graph, it's very, I don't want to bore you with graphs, but that blue and black thing, the black is actual production, the blue bar, the top graph, is used. That means in 1990, when this was given to me by a tobacco industry person, they fully anticipated that demand would actually exceed production worldwide. So great is the foreign market from the United States. So then you go down to the bottom graph and you see that our production back in the United States and also in Canada is a net uh, plus because we have been slightly declining in our consumption, but we are now the ugly Americans exporting to Asia, Africa, Central and Eastern Europe, and uh, uh, Latin America. Uh, meanwhile, breast cancer has long since been surpassed by lung cancer as the leading preventable cause of cancer death among women. And we'll come back to that in just a minute, but where did it all begin? I figured a couple of points on history would get us uh, swinging on this particular issue. There she is. This is one of the very origins of this. This is a typical cigarette trading card. And uh, this is the kind of thing that the tobacco companies did to try to get uh, people, particularly young boys, to save the cards and buy more cigarettes and they had to uh, entice them with this. Of course, because tobacco at that time, in the early 18, uh, mid 18, late 1800s, was primarily cigar and spitting tobacco that you had to spit in those beautiful brass platoons. So when the cigarette machines were invented, they had to create a market and they had to teach you how to inhale. And more importantly, they had to get you to try this awful stuff. And so they enticed you with young ladies. But if we notice, this is the very earliest uh, cartoon that I was able to find from Punch. Uh, Lady Nicotina, uh, hooking, in effect, literally, uh, all those uh, tentacles with nicotine. I mean, again, I'm not very funny, but it, it, this was the, the, the humor of, of that era. Or, um, this is really complex, uh, greed, cigarettes, there's the boys over on the right, there's dope, there's, you know, you got everything in there, and uh, it's sort of how I think, I guess, but this is the, the, the whole nature of what cartooning uh, approached this evil demon weed back in the 1870s. 
Um, Tully, uh, Roger uh, uh, re-alerted me to this cartoon by Thomas Nash of uh, uh, Thomas Greeley, uh, of, uh, of Greeley, the editor, uh, Horace Greeley, taking money from tobacco companies while running for president, but of course editorializing on the evils of smoking. And again, the, the beauty of this hypocrisy was in a presidential election, uh, tobacco was actually uh, uh, an issue that came up, and that's uh, uh, Boss Tweed in the background. Uh, I guess the cigar store Indian may have been a symbol for Boss Tweed uh, handing over some of the tobacco shares that the Greeley pocketed. Uh, you know, the, the cartoons that are about the next 50 years that I've been able to locate, not many, have been things like this, and I don't actually know the author that you could recognize it, uh, but, you know, cutting off uh, uh, tobacco and booze and so forth, the typical reformers and prohibition era pieces. Again, not something that present day humor really can relate to. But that's probably because the advertising uh, through the years was always so enticing. This is how grandma and great grandma began uh, lighting up. To keep a slender figure, no one could deny, reach for lucky instead of a sweet. You could see an ad for a, a candy bar saying no throat irritation, no cough. And, and yet this is exactly how women uh, began taking up cigarettes for their looks and to be slender. Um, uh, little Johnny would call for Philip Morris, and nobody ever stopped and wondered what sense of his growth, but the, the whole point was this company exists today uh, more than ever before. And athletes like Lou Gehrig, the famous baseball star, and Joe DiMaggio could say, uh, camels don't get your wind, and they could smoke as many as they please. Joe DiMaggio died a year ago of lung cancer. Um, and here is even, I, I thought this, you'd love this, this is Bud uh, Fisher, I think he did uh, Mutt and Jeff, here he is, to a, a hero uh, in uh, endorsing uh, Lucky Strike, yeah, I guess because it, it kept his hand steady or something, I mean it's just uh, astounding that cartoonists were part of this, and also I've identified several, Mutt and Jeff, uh, a whole host of cartoonists who work for the industry, even the Yellow Kid, I wasn't able to get into a slide yet, but the very earliest cartoon character, the Yellow Kid, uh, was uh, a, um, a major endorser for many, many years of, uh, of a brand of cigarettes, the uh, Admiral Cigarettes. And here's your Sunday Funnies, typical Sunday Funnies, the kids being taught to have healthy nerves. How do they do it? Oh, buy a pack of camels in your Sunday rotogravure and Sunday funny section. And uh, of course, before Joe Camel, there was Willie the Penguin, got a cold in the 1950s, this was, with smoke cool to do steady smoke for that clean, cool taste. But above all, oh, this one you will absolutely love, because this is my uh, personal all-time favorite for political cartooning. Uh, in either case, keep cool. Uh, I mean, if that doesn't say at all, even today, paying off both sides. And that's why I thought that Ralph Nader did so well. I mean, you know, who are you going to, I mean, you guys have been in business for years and years with uh, remembering uh, that, uh, that uh, this graph is an equal opportunity employer. But above all, doctors. And that's the key. The pages of American history are illuminated by the names of doctors who worked unceasingly to overcome disease and to make life happier and more secure for humanity. The leaders of camels are pleasantly proud of the standing of this cigarette among doctors. A nationwide survey of doctors' cigarette preferences was recently made. Three leading independent research organizations asked this question yes, of 113,597 doctors, <laughs> doctors in every field of medicine. What cigarette do you smoke, doctor? The brand named most was camel. Yes. According to a recent nationwide survey, more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. Sort of uh, had a bit of a change in voice there, you know, at the end. Uh, uh, but uh, they talked about the T zone, T for throat and T for taste, and today we say T for tracheotomy, which is a hole you've got to drill in there. And Rob Rogers, dad, they would know about that, and uh, it's been another inspiration for one of our uh, editorial cartoons. Here, you know, not much in this field, though, again, not too much humor, but there, this is from a magazine. Uh, which was the forerunner of almost all great humor magazines, Ballyhoo, in the 1930s. Uh, the advertising man, his hero, uh, shortened the Bull Durham, was Bull. I, I, I thought this cap captured things, and Caps was one of the really earliest, uh, uh, really good, pungent uh, uh, opportunities to ridicule the tobacco advertisers, but there really were not many people doing it, apart from Ballyhoo.
And then this is how I grew up, uh, Marlboro Country, every night, night in and night out. But thank God for Mad Magazine because they were always there with Marlboro Country and everything else. And, uh, you know, bless his heart, Mark Cohn saved so much of that great artwork. And, and I think that if it weren't for Mad, uh, we'd all be a lot worse off. I call it my leading medical journal. Uh, not today, though, because you notice they've taken ads. And guess who their first national advertiser is? Philip Mark. Uh, yeah, true. I will never buy another Mad Magazine again. Uh, here is Luther Terry. Uh, this is the guy who changed it. He was the Surgeon General in 1964. Now, most of the cartoons, obviously, that have been done on this issue have been done in the last 10 years. Guys, it's made my life really easy. I say it's been horrible. I have uh, I spent the better part of seven years on this. Please, enough on this issue. No. It's, it's, it's fascinating and it's fun. But it's amazing how this issue had not been really looked at a whole lot before. Even at the time the Surgeon General's report came out, you know, Herb Locke was there as he has been on almost every issue for the last, what, 72 years. Uh, you know, the simple image of the cop and nail uh, along the Surgeon General's report. This is reprinted in almost every news weekly. And uh, uh, the, the ultimate. Uh, Humor, though, began to creep in. Uh, York of the Louisville uh, papers said, now I'm so nervous I smoke nine packs a day. You know, this is how the effect of these, all these medical reports on, like, on people's psyche. And uh, uh, Herb Locke again, when Jimmy Carter was in power 13 years later, not much has changed. Uh, Carter was in the back pocket of the tobacco lobby blowing smoke at, at the health department, the Surgeon General, and the National Cancer Institute. And you know, when they got rid of Califano, for speaking out on this issue when Carter fired Califano. By the way, Carter's great on this issue today. You know, now they can't do anything about it. Oh, he's wonderful. And I think this is so true of so many of the politicians in this field. Fortunately, in Canada, you have a wonderful health minister who's probably the leading politician in the world who's actually ahead of his of bureaucrats on this issue. Uh, but here is Tony Off uh, talking about uh, you know the tobacco industry riding off with uh, Califano's head. I don't know, it's sort of a mixed metaphor there, but still, you know, it's, it's, uh, it gets the point that uh, they are able to get the man that they want in power. In this country, René Levesque, who I met literally uh, in a bookstore in Montreal autographing his book, he was the prime minister, uh, and, I, and he had two cigarettes going at the same time and was lighting a third. Uh, I mean, it's the most unbelievable guy you've ever seen, and this is how uh, Terry uh, did this particular character. But this could have been a symbol for Quebec when I was up here. And I asked him, hey, you know, you're, you're great. I, I really love your spirit, and, and I admire you so much. I wanted my oldest child to meet him. So we went to this book, and I said, but i got to tell you, I'm a doctor. Please, please do me a favor. Do something about the smoking. He says, nah, it's in the genes. It's in the genes. That was his response. Very sad, and I thought he could have been a greater contributor to life. But here is Conrad uh, during that era talking about how the FDA, Food and Drug Administration, was going after things like saccharin uh, while smoking was killing 400,000 people a year. That's the death toll today. You know, you could say all these allusions to that's more than all the AIDS, uh, pneumonia, TB, and so forth and so forth combined. And it really is. The leading preventable cause of tobacco death is heart disease, not lung cancer. But it's something that never gets sort of reported as much as the, uh, the dire lung cancer thing. Um, and you know, not all the cartoonists were on side. In fact, that's true today. Jim Warren in the, in the late 70s when I was in Miami was making fun of those of us who were working on uh, uh, this issue and you know, saying as they did today in the headlines in Ontario, you know, what's the matter with the outdoor police? Why aren't you going after that? So here's the smoke police inside. This is the Spanish version. Uh, you know, trying to do something about this guy smoking while all the pollution is going on outside. And Jim is great. He's, I told him about this and the other ones that he'd done, and he said, you know, go with it, you know, because he has done some of the most pungent stuff in recent years, and I think that's a testimony to somebody who's seen uh, the truth in terms of what this industry has done compared to some of the propaganda. They used to blame every lung cancer on everything but smoking, and uh, I think that he's seen a different line. I thought Malden's take on this was great. Uh, just when the smoking issue in public places was getting started, he said, you know, with a drunk getting on the elevator, mind if I drink? Uh, or uh, uh, more or less simple uh, image of a cigarette vending machine in the shape of a coffin. And uh, I, I thought Engelhardt's, uh, or St. Louis Engelhardt's uh, version of uh, the tobacco industry, you're right to use young people in your ads. Uh, I think it says in the bottom, smokers don't live long, you know. 
And I think the Grim Reaper has been a, a favorite of a lot of folks, but in this instance it was particularly effective. Or a classic. I call this one of my very, very few classic Ed Stein takes when Reagan was, was not reimbursing for school lunches and was saying things like ketchup is a vegetable. And she was, the, the, the dietician is leaning over and says, sorry kid, the government subsidizes tobacco, not school lunches. Have a cigarette, it will dull your appetite. And, uh, you know, this has always disturbed me that in the field of journalism, and I do belong to the side of professional journalists, you talk about coronary risk factors on the front cover, a whole front page story, and selling a pack of risk factors on the back cover. You know, the tragedy of the New York Times, it has probably been through the years, as well as Time Magazine and Newsweek, the leading uh, recipients of tobacco advertising largesse. Oh, they made a big deal in 1999 about not taking any more cigarette ads. Of course, the next week they were taking all the Philip Morris corporate ads, saying, oh, we, we give to art museums and, and poor kids in Bosnia. But, the, you know, this is the way that, that the New York Times gets to clean its past by pretending that it's morally outraged in 1999. Well, when they took over the Sarasota paper in 1982, they changed the policy that had been in effect since 1948 when the publisher's father died of lung cancer. And that policy was, as the first newspaper in the United States of a non-religious variety, to, to say, we will not, it is our prerogative, we will not accept tobacco advertising. They were the only major newspaper, the only major daily that did that. And guess what the New York Times did in 82? That's one of the first things they changed. They, they reaccepted cigarette advertising. I, I really, truly believe if he's looking for hypocrisy in this issue, this is number one. And this was expressed in the cartoon. Uh, in what was called the Mooney paper, the New York Tribune, which is the sister of the Washington Times, uh, lucrative cigarette ads posed moral paradox for the New York Times. Well, there was no paradox at all. The Times was never bothered. Oh, they might ban ads for guns, because they don't like people who uh, own or, or use guns or whatever, and they don't perhaps believe in the Second Amendment, but they also don't uh, have any, uh, and they don't have any X-rated movie ads, but they've had no problems until 1999 of taking uh, tobacco ads. So this, uh, theme by uh, Taylor of uh, nuclear war uh, or, or, or uh, handguns or cigarettes as uh, the ones that was least reported was cigarettes. I got a call during a Minnesota trial by a reporter from the Pioneer Press asking me in 1998, uh, hey, what happened? Where were we? I've been back in our back files in the morgue and I haven't seen any real articles for 20 years on smoking in our newspaper. Well, it was there, but this issue wasn't being covered. So when I became editor of the, of the Medical Journal of Australia, I asked uh, Wayne Stasekull if he might consider doing a cover for me. And this was the first editorial cartoon that I know that had ever appeared on the cover of a peer-reviewed medical journal. And what it was, I sort of said, let's brainstorm on this. And I said, you know, I, I don't know how you stand on I think I did know how he stood, but I said, I don't want to bias you, but if it's okay, why don't we explore this of having sort of, you know, a guy and a wife walking down the street and, and bemoaning the fact that kids are smoking while there's cigarette ads everywhere you look. So basically the caption says, you can try to keep kids from smoking, but I guess peer pressure is just too great. And uh, I was in Australia, at the time a lot of these brands are Australian brands. And um, Wayne had come to my attention when he was at the Chicago Tribune. And uh, the, at that time, I was trying to get the American Medical Association to drop their tobacco stock. You'd think that would be a no-brainer, but they actually voted to keep the stock, saying, what are you going to ask us to sell next, our nuclear power stock or something? And so they didn't get it. Uh, it's the only time I actually ever made it into an editorial cartoon. And this is Sullivan's uh, take on that in, I think, the Worcester paper in, in Massachusetts. Seven out of ten doctors agree it may be dangerous to our health, but it's great for our pension fund. You know, that was the, the way that, and that's, that's how they, uh, they, they invested in tobacco. Um, so Wayne's take on this was the physician admonishing the patient with the headline in the background and the x-ray in front of them saying, I can't tell you how strongly enough, Mr. Morrison, if your cigarettes are made by anybody other than Philip Morris or Reynolds Industries, you've got to stop smoking. I mean, you know, this is, I think it's my favorite all-time cartoon. And, and I don't think anybody has taken on this issue. I've, I've collected over 85 staples on this thing. And, and Wayne is, is the most amazing guy that, that I have spoken to. He's been very helpful over these years. His other great one, I think, on this issue is the store and telling the, the clerk, now two coughs in a week means they want king regular. One cough and a hack means menthol light. Three coughs, Botox, acid. And this is, this is just over the top, you know? Thanks. I think that's uh, well-deserved for Wayne to be. Uh, but Paul Jeffrey did this piece uh, showing again the conflict. You know, you read the headline one day out of a decade, death toll with chief 400,000 in Europe. Oh my God. So, phew, when he realized this is so many cigarette smoking, for a minute there I thought it was a real disaster. 
you know. And I think that summarizes this entire issue. And through the 80s, he had these reports, secondhand smoke kills, so Dick Adair said, you better cut down on your breathing. I mean, you know, uh, or uh, Kelly's got it down pat. He's got all the studies down pat. Studies show non-smokers better educated. <laughs> I mean, says it all. His other take on the study was uh, uh, smoking an impotence link. Marlboro man, Schmalbro man. Um, or warning labels. Okay, let's pay tribute uh, to, to Tom Darcy, who died this year, and I, I think captured one of the best warning labels. Warning labels have been a great spotter for you. Uh, warning, smokers develop a slight weed, commonly mistaken for a husky, sexy voice. That would be the label that the tobacco industry had its way. Or how about this one from Jack, who also died uh, this year, Jack Oates. Uh, the Surgeon General warned Polly Mantle, what are you, some kind of dummy? Do you realize what you're doing? Yes, these things will kill you. Boy, are they bad. <laughs> and um, another warning label, you're the scum of the earth. Uh, hmm, <laughs> too strong. That's our other angle on it. And, uh, and from Canada, uh, I, I haven't met him, I was talking with him, but you know, Canada has the toughest warnings in the world. They've got pictures of lungs. And I was with a guy last night who created the, the graphic warning labels, and he's really setting the standard. And I tell you, when you see these things and you open them up and there's more garbage about smoking, it, it's so bothersome to the person who smokes. It. But this is how his reaction was. You're going to die with those voices. And uh, Etta Holtz had uh, this take on the 1980s. Uh, the, uh, the, the psychiatrist listening to, I gave a fast sleep, lethargy drugs, tobacco, and unsafe sex. Now I think I'm addicted to Surgeon General C. Edward Cooper. <laughs> And what about Coop? David took uh, uh, Coop on the, on the right hand, and our favorite character of all, I mean, this, this could keep you forever, uh, uh, Jesse Helms on the left. And this is the schizophrenia that he's talking about in that warning level. Warning, cigarette smoking may cause severe schizophrenia. That's good old Uncle Sam. That's the problem with our country. And here he is again saying, but look, Senator Helms, our teacher says smoking is bad for our health. Nonsense, you can't get AIDS from cigarettes. Or David, uh, or or um, uh, uh, Jimmy, Jimmy Barbulli saying, "I've approved your national endowment for the arts grant. Go on and put up your exhibit." That's when he was opposing uh, Maplethorpe and all the homosexuality things, and he was approving this kind of artwork all over the country. Um, and Senator Helms also having a smoke coming out of his ears when smoking was banned on airplane flights. Gary Brookins uh, took him apart on that, even in tobacco country. And Dick Locker said, uh, the ir the, he pointed out the irony of, of what we can do and can't do in schools. I can pray on airlines, but I can't smoke. And in schools, smoke, but don't get caught praying. And similarly, uh, Summers said that, that when Jocelyn Elders was talking about sex, it's perfectly OK for kids to have sex. Hey, he'll even, we'll even give them free condoms, but they better not smoke a cigarette afterwards. And. Uh, one of the great ironies of our time is that we still have in Canada and the United States the only two countries that I'm aware of that still sell cigarettes in pharmacies. Uh, so this speaks for itself. And uh, Portman did it again. I mean, he really took an irony that I think had not been pictured before. And, and lo and behold, I'm walking down the street. There it is. Killing Puck, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So Carlson and Mark Sheen better be out for this one. Um, and uh, I thought that Joel Pett had it down pat too, how we're going after kids and, and smoke a And I don't know. Um, I love it, but Disney will never sell the rights, you know. Or this other take that, that Ben Sargent said, uh, which, you know, is, is, is a, a, a deep one here. From the front office, you need to lay low for a while. Smoke stinkies. I love that name. Smoke stinkies with the teething ring. Um, and, and it's true, all over the world, kids are actually not only smoking, but they're selling this. And this is a typical shot. I think this came from, uh, uh, well, it's Southeast Asia. It might be from the Philippines. Um, and, and Danziger uh, pointed out as the analogous uh, thing to that famous uh, escape from Vietnam uh, when Americans were, were getting out of there. And here's the tobacco executives getting out of, as it's getting hot in this country and, and in the United States, getting on the helicopters going all over the world. Indeed, uh, Graham McKay summarized the Canadian and the American experience best in his piece uh, that simply talked about the cash cow. I mean, 
it's just both artistically and, 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 uh, and philosophically probably the epitome of this issue, how government has both warned on the one hand and cashed in on, its, uh, on the other hand and has given subsidies on the one hand and given little uh, warning labels on the other. It's just an, an astounding uh, hypocrisy. Uh, or perhaps one of our chief uh, hypocritical examples, too, is the idea of taxing cigarettes and watching where that money goes. According to Bob Burrell, our tobacco plan calls for a big increase in the price of cigarettes, said Clinton. Now each pack costs $1,000 donation to the Democratic National Committee. And that's the problem. This money has gone traditionally in the United States uh, uh, to the tobacco industry, but over the last 10 years, it has gone a lot now from the tobacco industry to the plaintiff's lawyers to the Democratic National Committee. It's an interesting thing that nobody is untouched and unclean from tobacco money. Uh, of course, Mike Smith said that after he, he'd been found lying, having been impeached for lying, Bill Clinton embarked on a new career, chairman of uh, Big Tobacco. By the way, that term, I haven't been able to find anything referring to that term prior to around 1992 in the Baltimore Sun. But that's what I think we all know. That it, the Republican Party of the United States, this one is uh, uh, Patterson from the, uh, now the Washington Post, just this graphic of the Association of Tobacco Money and the Republican Party, or Clay Bennett's take of the Republican National Convention with delegates from AT&T, Pfizer, R.J. Arnavisco, and Philip Morris. And uh, 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 Brent Brandon's simple image of the GOP, the smoking uh, uh, smoke ring, or uh, uh, Benson's piece with the, he's got so much in there, you know, you've got uh, the guy riding big tobacco, riding the GOP, and the elephant uh, carrying what looks like uh, uh, lumber at first, and then he realizes it's cigarettes. And uh, ultimately, Mike Peters said it, uh, uh, kill elephant. Uh, and there he is, that's the symbol of our age, probably gave more cartoonists, more uh, uh, fodder uh, than anything. And this is a typical image uh, long gone, perhaps, but uh, not forgotten. And maybe the best, also all-time take on that was uh, uh, Wilkinson's uh, uh, Joke Camel of later years. I think that that piece has probably been reproduced more than any other Joke Camel cartoon. And uh, uh, I think, too, Milt said it when he pointed out something in 1994. He took a look at the fact that there was some kind of report issued 1994 talking about smoking and he simply sat back and said happy 30th anniversary stupid and that's where it was and this is that reporter calling me from the Minnesota paper saying where were we what did we do what how come we've missed the story I don't know I think the cartoonist could have played an even more important role but gosh if it wasn't for you I don't think this issue would be anywhere and then I think another all-time favorite of mine is in 1994 when David Kessler announced he was going to do some investigation. Dr. Kessler, FDA commissioner, announced today that scientific studies revealed nicotine is addictive. Oh, and this just in, scientists have just received confirmation of gravity. I mean, you know, I went to high school with David Kessler. I went to college with him. He was a couple years behind me. I gave the medical school commencement address when he was on faculty. Not until the day he gave that press conference, just before ABC was about to bash him and the FDA for doing nothing on smoking, as Conrad had pointed out in the 1970s, had he ever said a word on smoking. A total off the top of his head thing, and I think it's amazing how medical politicians are. You know, they try to reinvent themselves for the sake of the news media. And uh, I think Bach really ultimately said it when the FDA started going after Joe Camel. Sorry, we don't need you to make smoking cool with kids anymore. We've got the FDA. You know, when government comes down on you, what better weapon do you have when the government tells you not to do something or not to believe something? And maybe uh, just had this one, uh, the Joe Camel era, uh, after Joe Camel, nothing has changed. Trust me, teenage smoking is going up, and I think this one, which was reproduced in the annual Newsweek of, of cartoons, I think, of the decade, really says it best. Nothing has changed. Or tolls uh, reminding us uh, the new anti-smoking tax brings that to $7.57 a pack, but the kids with $150 Nikes are saying, don't you have anything more expensive? Taxes don't do it with kids. They'll pay anything for marbles, and that's what's been overlooked. I know that Bruce Beatty and, and uh, um, uh, Garner and the Washington Times and Borgman have all done variations of this theme, and, and, and yet each one is brilliant. I thought this one really captured it. And Jim Day is this, uh, said, how about this disincentive for getting kids to smoke? You know, call them math 101. Or Wayne Stasco had a warning label that said, warning, smoking is good for you. You know, that'll drive them away.
and um, uh, and we'll, we'll try to let's see if that uh, we'll go on to the next uh, is that the uh, end of that particularly just got a few more there great and I, I this next one is in, is uh, remembering uh, um, Jeff McNally I believe who uh, has a great uh, I think personal responsibility takes this issue he and Michael Ramirez I think are my heroes of personal responsibility and well actually this is Jim Lang while Clinton was uh, was uh, uh, not worried seemingly about uh, marijuana because he was uh, perhaps using it and cocaine and heroin uh, you know uh, Rome is, is burning uh, with teen cigarette smoking and I really think he's got a way of capturing these uh, uh, images in, in a way or Jeff McNally saying all right drop the cigarette uh, at a crack house and um, um, or, or they're saying okay I give up who are you Rush Limbaugh or Bill Clinton and you know if you've heard Limbaugh railing on about the anti-smokers the smoking Nazis, the anti-smoking Nazis, while he's promoting his cigar, uh, from, you know, it's it's. Uh, I thought it was joined uh, Clinton smoking cigars while claiming to fight smoking, and Limbaugh being such a, 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 a windbag on this issue. But uh, Michael Ramirez also captured it. It's okay, man. It's hot. <laughs> if Joe Camel were promoting marijuana, or his other take, I need a prescription. He's saying to the doctor to smoke marijuana to relieve the nausea from chemotherapy, which I take for lung cancer from smoking cigarettes. And diversification. This was the way the tobacco companies thought that they could get around uh, having to have corporate responsibility for this particular issue. And so Kirk uh, captured it beautifully with the skulls you can see in the bottom there. Circle the wagon, Marlboro makes 10 times the profit of all the 3,000 Philip Mars food products combined. And so that's why they acquire these things. They're back on TV. They're still among the two or three top advertisers on television. Notice if you watch Nightline, I mean, they're the saviors of the world. Oh, they give to poor battered women shelters, and they help kids do literacy. And of course, they give to art museums. And, and this is the kind of way that Philip Mars says, you know, who are you going to believe, us or your own eyes? And you're not seeing the patients with emphysema that I am with their oxygen tanks, as Sidney pointed out with Joe Campbell, the later years, you're not seeing the devastation caused by this in the hospitals and the nursing homes. And we're not talking about older people in nursing homes. We're talking about pulmonary cripples. Hard, hard phrase to use, I realize. But you're talking about 50-year-old guys with emphysema sitting, unable to breathe. And, uh, you know, Rob Rogers said, uh, due to Clinton's tough stance on cigarettes, uh, the tobacco companies are saying, we've decided to diversify. We'll, be, we'll now be making landmines. You know, another way to bring it. And I think he's got the diversification issue down pat because he also had one of my all-time favorites. Hmm, I knew Philip Morris' purchase of Nabisco, which would be a bad idea. Tobacco juice. Another great breakfast treat. Um, there are variations on this. You know, we've used freeze-dried Oreo cookies in our new smoke, you know, that type of thing. But, uh, or cancer, I think, it said something about with the new creamy menthol centers, you know. Um, or Walt Hamilton said, man, these things are addictive as the kids are eating uh, Oreo cookies. Um, and I think Dennis John captures the entire issue of litigation because this was lurking behind diversification. It's lurking behind all of the concern, allegedly, that we take towards teenagers on, uh, on smoking. This issue of lawsuits. And he knew. Uh, I was driving out of Scranton. I had gone to try to track down a, a priest who had, uh, I, I know I need one, but I mean, who, who had written about smoking and advertising and ethics in the 1960s and 50s. And he had been asked by the tobacco industry to write about this, and he's come to the conclusion that these guys were unethical and immoral. And, he, and, uh, and I tracked him down in Scranton, and as I always buy the paper on the way out, and I was reading the paper, and I saw this piece, and I called Dennis, and he helped me get this collection started because he said, oh, great, that sounds like a great idea to do an exhibition on this subject. Let me send you that and a donation to United Way in, in, in exchange. But I love that, that kind of uh, uh, simple image. Or Gary Brookings also said, lawsuits for Philip Morris, uh, another takeoff on Little Johnny. And uh, uh, maybe Mike Lukovich uh, had the best take on it. Bad news, it spread. You now have lawsuits up the wazoo. <laughs> and uh, Kevin uh, pointed out uh, this guy coughing and coughing and then coughing his lungs out. And the industry is saying, OK, besides that, uh, what makes you think I should cough up some money? And, and you know, uh, that's, that's really what it's all about, health or money. And, 
I think maybe we got into some really crazy things with lawsuits. Here's Signe saying, the cigarette that I was forced to smoke dropped ashes on the silicon breast that I was forced to implant, and they melted all over the hamburger I hadn't cooked, so that's why I deserve $325 million. Or, uh, how about this one? Uh, Mike Keith saying, I once dated a flight attendant, cough, cough. Oh man, the next wave of lawsuits, third hand smoking. But leave it to Ted Rawl to come up with the ultimate lawsuit. Uh, fourth hand smoke. Unfortunately, yet another threat alert. Sally was just an innocent 37 year old until her brother in law's boss's neighbor took up smoking. Within weeks, she was dead, the victim of fourth hand smoke. And uh, Bruce Plant had the ultimate take on lawsuits, too. With studies says that babies whose mothers smoke during pregnancy are more likely to become criminals. I did it because my mother smoked. And uh, I think Scott also captured it very, very well. Uh, and more like I would see it, you know, another loss in court, I ask you, haven't I suffered enough? And, uh, you know, this is what these guys do. I did a deposition the other night. You think in any way, shape, or form these guys are contrite or they're changed? Trust me. Whether we win or lose this particular case and whether I favor or don't favor lawsuits as a redress of this issue, these guys, one guy said, you're the, you're the most hostile witness I've seen in 23 years, you know, and uh, as I took it as a compliment, uh, but they, they have not given an inch. They will say publicly, oh yes, we acknowledge that there are data that implicate smoking, but in court, they are vilifying every person who has had a tobacco-related disease. Most of these cases, incidentally, are not about getting money to people. They are about punishing the industry, and I think that's very clear. The big $145 billion verdict in Florida, I testified in that case, and everybody's saying, how can you do They don't deserve that money for being stupid enough to smoke. No, but if you look at what that jury did, two years, the only jury in history that was locked up for two years, not confined, but they had two years on a case they were told would last two or three months. It was the tobacco industry, as they have done for 40 years, that, had, that drew that case out to over two years. And here's Kevin's take again when that verdict came in. Uh, the plaintiffs do not seek truth. They do not seek justice. They only seek money. And she's saying, no truth, no justice, only money. Hey, hey, that's our mom. Great. We can sue them for copyright infringement. <laughs> you know, if, if that isn't the perfect lawyer, uh, Kevin and, and I um, talked about the, the uh, Daumier exhibition in, in uh, Washington last year that Oliphant did some really great work on. I mean, if this wasn't an honor for me to be with Kevin talking about this, a guy who really comes close to Daumier in, 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 in sending up lawyers and reading about Oliphant sending up lawyers. Uh, and David Fitzsimmons sent me this one, which I had seen in the Tucson paper. Party's over, dirtbag. And it's the first time I've ever seen dirtbag in a, in, a, uh, in a cartoon, which I love. And he enclosed a letter. Uh, my mother and father died within a month of each other um, uh, over, uh, because of their inability to overcome their addiction to cigarettes. I understand firsthand the impact of tobacco on the lives of people. A simple two-sentence letter. I didn't ask for this. I had called him and congratulated him on it. He sent it in the mail, and I got it the next week with that letter, and I, I could have sworn there was a tear on it. I mean, really, it was the, one of the most heartwarming things that's ever happened since I've been collecting. And Gary Garvardo summarized it best, too, by saying, um, uh, as that verdict came in, that was about to bankrupt uh, the industry. And if you notice, the Florida legislature quickly went to pass the law saying, no, 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 let's cap the damages because they did not want to lose out of back those settlements. So the goose that laid the golden eggs was about to be stopped, not by, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the tobacco industry. I mean, and, and it was, in fact, by Uncle Sam and all the state's attorneys general who were cocky and saying, oh, we got the money. And indeed, that's what this whole $206 billion settlement was all about. It was all about money. Almost nothing now goes to fight smoking. It almost all goes to the lawyers and to other things. And this was a Golden Spike Award winner, Rex Babin, saying, we're through talking to his tracheostomy too. And I don't know why that was spiked, because this, the Albany papers should have been ashamed of themselves, because this is, in my mind, one of the all-time classics. And uh, they had controlled the earlier settlement, if you recall, that was going up to like $500 billion that McCain was trying to get through Congress that didn't pass once it got to Congress. And another way that Rex uh, looks at this issue, I think a cigarette lighter as a capital is a perfect take. And uh, Sheriff uh, has done a similar thing with the FDA and, and the Justice, uh, the Supreme Court, 
using that as, a, as an ashtray, and, and, and similar simple images have been wonderful. And, and David Reddick uh, pointed out that this was indeed, uh, so why do I feel like I'm inhaling a secondhand deal? And indeed, unfortunately, the Attorney General didn't realize this. The only error on this cartoon is that the Attorney General bragging, oh, we've got big tobacco. They got back taxes. That's all they got. And they got an agreement that was written by the tobacco industry that has done virtually nothing. And all the fans, if he didn't put that big tobacco on there on the back, it would be the perfect cartoon. Because he's, he's, and I know Joel doesn't like when we label everything and so forth, but here it is, the state naively going in holy matrimony with the big tobacco. You know, after this, I'm going to change you. Yeah, sure you are, honey. You also signed away your right to nag. And that's exactly what the state did. That captures this entire issue. Or Ed Stein saying, good news here, you're covered by the tobacco windfall fund, so people injured in the grab for the tobacco windfall. <laughs> it's all about money. Both sides, the plague on both their houses, that this is what the plaintiff's lawyers and the, and the attorneys general want on the one hand, and uh, the tobacco industry wants on the other hand. And Chris Britt uh, was talking also about the false promises of these particular, you know, they like to promote the fact that uh, things were going to change in Marlboro country. I'm going to miss these roundups. Well, in fact, uh, as, as they're rounding up the kids, in fact, it didn't change. Nothing has changed. They're, they're just a little bit more subtle. And Sachs said uh, to one of the lawyers groups that picked up, this is no joke, these guys cashed in $566 million for their fees. I'm not saying they didn't do any work, but they did very, very little work. Maybe my favorite all-time lawyer, well, there is two. This is Wiley's take on class action suits. As the sole attorney of this lifeboat, it is my duty to refrain from any rowing in order to save my strength for filing our class action lawsuits. And, and what that means is suddenly the decision on who to sacrifice for food was a lot easier. Or, ultimately, Peter Steinem says it best. Sure, my fee for the tobacco deal was $100 million, but I, I worked really hard. And, and if you see what these guys do, they don't work really hard. I work with plaintiff lawyers who have, out of their own pocket, worked on these, but not the lawyers hired by the state's attorneys general, not the Mike Moore lawyers, not the uh, down in Mississippi, not the Texas lawyers, the Gang of Five that cashed in. These guys, no joke, they demanded $100 billion as their fee, not $100 million. They demanded $100 billion, the five lawyers in Texas, because they calculated that if you pay $17.6 billion, which is what they claimed to have negotiated, over 25 years, you come up with $200 billion, we want half of it. So, so help me, and, that's, and they only got $3.3 billion as their, as their fee. In California, wacky things like banning smoking in bars uh, came out. This was a very big issue. Actually, it's been sort of nice to go and have a drink and not have the smoking. No smoking in bar, California state law. Smoking poses a public health hazard, says the bartender. Can I get you another double? Or Ann pointing out with a bubble gum or the lollipop or come here off the beach. And uh, maybe uh, this one in Canada uh, with the uh, guy getting angry and graffitiing a Boy Scout uniform required to go into a bar. Or uh, maybe uh, Terry uh, might have gone over the top on this one. Topless? Uh, well, you can't do, you can do that, but you can't smoke. Lady, did you know it's against law to smoke virtually everywhere in Ontario? And uh, maybe a gamble pointed out some of the folly of the, uh, of the research that's going on. Cellular phones, caffeine, and tobacco. And the caffeine person is saying, this new guy's driving me crazy, talking on the phone day and night. Quick, let me bum a cigarette. And maybe Gary Brookings had it best, too, by saying, uh, how about this? We let the federal government decide that nicotine is an addictive drug, but they have to use their FBI crime lab. <laughs> and, and maybe the ultimate sad story, as we've come back from the very beginning to this one, just as we started this talk talking about women and smoking, getting their equal smoking rights, just this uh, year, just about a month and a half ago, this headline appeared. Smoking now top female cancer killer. We could have told you this in 1979 when Surgeon General Julius Richmond told me that this was going to happen. And we didn't really see this in Cosmo and Ms. Magazine and other women's magazines through the years. They've had a terrible failed responsibility. And my last cartoon is Gary Markstein's take on this one. Women smoking deaths have doubled. And the tobacco guy's saying, finally, the focus is off of targeting kids.